to Realism Overhaul. Today we are accepting the first artificial satellite contract, which gives us a ton of funds ahead of time, as well as a ton more funds for completing it. But in order to construct a rocket capable of orbiting the Earth, we need a launch pad that can hold more than 20 tons. So our first order of business is constructing Launch Complex B, which can hold 60 tons. In the previous series, I was using the exploit of rolling out rockets that had absolutely no fuel in them and fueling them on the launch pad to get around the KCT 20 ton limit, because it weighed a lot less than 20 tons with no fuel in it. However, that is, that is a major exploit in the game, and I'm no longer going to be doing that. However, you can still do this to get around that limit to perform simulations and to build the rocket ahead of time. And that is exactly what we are going to do here. We have the rocket being built, as well as the launch pad being built right alongside to sort of save a little bit of time. Our first flight today is the KX-3 jet, which is looking to complete an X-plane supersonic flight. This particular flight is going to hold 12.75 kilometers at around 575 meters per second, so a little bit faster and a little bit higher than the previous light. I did actually just remember we do have another RD-102 photo being built right now as well. I believe it is ahead of the Aero 2. Uh, the reason I fit an RD-102 photo in before the Aero 2 was because the Aero 2 took 140 some days. I think the RD-102 took 80 some days. I don't remember how long they actually took. But I wasn't able to launch the Aero 2 until the launch pad was upgraded, and I believe that took around 200, if not more, days. Essentially, I timed it out so with an RD-102 before the Aero 2, the Aero 2 would finish being constructed right around the same time the launch pad finished upgrading, well, not upgrading, finished creating another pad. And with our VAB solely focused after the RD-102 photo on getting something into orbit, which happens to be on larger rockets which take longer to build, our funds were pretty much not coming from the VAB anymore, which is why these supersonic flights were actually very nice. And what's interesting about these supersonic contracts is the more time between accepting of these contracts, the more rewards you'll get from accepting the next one. So I was waiting around 100 to 200 days between accepting another supersonic flight contract, and the reward went up to a total of, with accepting and completion, over 20k funds. And this meant we're pretty much able to keep our program afloat just from these KX3 flights alone. Mind you, I would rather not have to keep doing these forever. I would hope that the uh, the orbital contract works so we can get a large amount of funds to really kickstart our program. The RD-102 photo flight went nominally the same as before, not only completing a contract, but also collecting a little bit of data on the RD-102 for Aero 2's launch since the RD-102 is one of the main engines used on Aero 2. This flight will be the final flight of 1955, bringing us into 1956. Now it's time to showcase Aero 2, the first rocket ever attempting orbit of the Earth in 1956. Now it is being launched on the brand new Launch Complex B, able to hold 60 tons, and I believe this rocket uh, weighed in at around 40 tons. Configuration of this rocket is two A4s lifting off from the pad, and then a RD-102 is going to hot stage right before the A4s flame out to carry us into a suborbital trajectory. And then to circularize and finish off the orbit hopefully, we have two stages of Arabies. The first having four Arabies, the last having one. The stages bringing us into a suborbital trajectory are guided, but once we are in space and we let go of the Arabie stages, there is an avionics core that will point us in the right direction and hopefully at the right time, spin stabilize the Arabies and let them go. Absolutely 
everything going nominally so far in the launch until this point. Reaching the final era beauty stages, I believe I waited too long to actually light the third stage, meaning we were too close to our apogee, and given the burn times of these air bees, that meant we were going to start falling back towards the earth before we finished our burn, losing a little bit of efficiency. And that would have felt bad enough. However, in my defense, our final air bee actually had a performance loss, and the launch may have gotten to orbit regardless of when I lit the Araby stages, if that didn't happen. I don't know if we lost ISP or if we lost thrust, but either way, the Arrow 2 fell short of orbit. Around the same time in 1956, we had another KX-3 flight, which was getting us a little bit of funds to well, help bolster our program, help bolster uh, my nerves, because if this orbital contract fails, it might be it for the program. Bob flew the previous KX-3, and now we've got Valentina flying this one. Both of uh, the remaining crew members of our crew, since, well, we know what happened to the other two. Now, unfortunately, we're getting closer and closer to the crew's retirement dates in 1958. It's only two years away, and these flights are not adding any time to their retirement dates. These Kerbals just aren't having it. They don't want to stick around. It'd be nice if we could get them into space. However, there are a lot of tech nodes between now and getting capsules. So that means we may be hiring Kerbals soon as well. to the next few steps towards having an orbital rated rocket. I had decided amidst all that's going on to invest in a new engine, solely on the fact that this engine, um, the something something A series, I don't remember, had a burn time of 140 seconds. That is twice the length of any of our other engines so far. The only problem with this engine is it has a 30% ignition failure rate, and that is monumentally terrifying. Considering the way this is timed out, we really have only two more shots at getting into orbit. So I send up two of these thick looking rockets uh, with an A-series underneath just to get some more data for it, and it was really, really likely that these would fail on the launch pad or not burn through all of their fuel. However, both of these tests worked, and I am absolutely surprised by this. So initially, what was a 30% ignition failure rate went down to, I believe, 15%. And by the time the Aero 2.5 launches, It'll be even lower because on that rocket, although it takes a little bit longer to build, I added some pre-flight telemetry to the A-Series engine just so that that number goes down and I think it was around 8.5% at launch, which was around the same as the RD-102 or the A-4 at the time. So in the matter of half a year, we have a new engine that has the same rated performance, or not performance, um, reliability as the other engines in our program. The only difference being this one has a very long burn time comparatively, which is extraordinarily helpful and very, very cool. Launching now is the Aero 2.5, and you'll notice it only needs one engine on the first stage as opposed to the three on the Aero 2. And that as well, again thanks to the A-Series engine. Everything else about the rocket is the same, 
and it is still trying to complete that same goal of putting the first artificial satellite in Earth orbit. Nominal launch so far. At this point, we are spin stabilizing and letting go of the air bees. Crossing our fingers, because at this point, we simply have to hope that nothing goes wrong. out of our final Airb engine and taking a look at the orbital info, we are officially in orbit. The contract is complete. We got a periapsis of 179 kilometers, apoapsis of 897 kilometers. This is both monumental and a lifesaver for our program. And taking a look now at our charts, uh, we have through the first orbital contract, the stats of well, the program so far, and taking a look at funds, you'll see kind of uh, how much of a boost this is. We haven't seen this much spare funds since, well, ever really. With that complete, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.